I've been testing this 3D printer, but is it really a review? You be the judge as we look at the Alta 4. This is the Alta 4 3D printer. It boasts high speed thanks to having linear rails. Now this version here is said to be a prototype and there's been some good things about it, but also some issues. The question is, if you were to buy one of these, would you end up with one that's fully tested or will you end up with something that quickly becomes out of date? Well, that's a question I asked the company and we'll get to their answer later on. But first, let's check out the specs. First things first, the price, and this printer goes for just under US $400. Key features for this printer are the unique build volume of 260 by 310 by 305 high and the dual axis linear guide rails. It also claims to maintain high printing quality all the way up to 150 millimeters per second. Apart from that, it has cable chains and built-in auto bed leveling, filament runout detection, and power loss recovery. It also makes the rare claim of having thermal runaway protection. Now I said there were some issues and by far the worst part of using this 3D printer came from the unboxing and initial assembly. Now this part of the process should have been very straightforward. As you can see, the printer came in in three parts, a base, a gantry, and then a filament holder. Why am I removing the cover from the bottom of the printer? Well, because it was in a really bad way when I unboxed it. While inspecting the linear rails, I noticed that they were quite loose on top of the printer. And then I noticed on the other side that the Z axis motor was completely missing, while the one that was still present was quite wobbly. The bottom electronics cover was really greasy and filthy and as I wiped it down I noticed that it too had shattered at some stage during the shipping. On the inside, besides the rogue stepper motor, there was some wiring unplugged as well and some of the bolts had gone inside the power supply. After reassembling everything carefully, I thought I was ready to go so I peeled off the protective film and fired up the printer. Unfortunately when I tried to auto home the printer, there was a very loud grinding noise. Great. I started by checking the switch with a multimeter and found that it was functioning as it should be. I also checked that the carriage was moving far enough to activate the switch. That just left the main board and sure enough there was a crack joint that I had to resolder. Now the printed instructions were pretty ordinary, but it's worth mentioning what was on the SD card. There was more detailed manuals in PDF format, a copy of Cura and a USB driver, SDLs for all of the printed parts on the machine, and most significantly, a set of pictures and videos to help you with troubleshooting in case you were encountering issues with your initial prints. There was also a hex file of compiled firmware. As this printer has dual Z lead screws, I use the supplied wooden blocks to get everything level before using a piece of paper to level each corner of the bed. Now the gold stuff you see is Captain Tape. That's quite an outdated form for 3D printing, so I peeled it off as there was nothing in the instructions saying to keep it. This printer has auto bed leveling and the Z offset was way off from factory. Although the menu and function to do a live adjust of this was present, it worked for the current print but when I started the next one, I found that everything had reset. The nozzle was no longer close enough, the print started to peel up and eventually failed. I had to follow the obscure process in the manual to get it to be persistent. Now that was a complete disaster having to rebuild part of the printer and even break out the soldering iron just to get the printer to work. Now I passed my concerns back to the company and they said they would substitute this horribly crumbly foam packaging with something a lot more durable. Anyway, with all those hurdles jumped, I thought it was time to start printing and I started with the two pre-sliced models on the SD card. I believe each of them was meant to be a phone stand at 0.16 layer height and 0.1 layer height. Both of them printed okay, but in my opinion, the 0.16 version looks a little bit better than the 0.1 because it has some gaps and some stringing. Next up, I installed the auto version of Cura 3.6 with an inbuilt profile. I then loaded up this Flexi Octopus, which seemed to print quite well. The surface finish is quite even, it negotiated the overhangs well, and these print in place models are a good test for extrusion. If you over extrude, everything will weld itself together, but in this case, we had no such problems. I then tested out the Cura profile with the ubiquitous Benchy. As far as Benchies go, this one's quite reasonable. The cooling looks quite good on the underside of the boat. And probably the only complaint I would have is a little bit of ringing and some mild surface artifacts known as zebra stripes. 
Happy that this thing was putting out reasonable prints, I decided to try my own slicer, Simplify 3D, with the slicing profile on the SD card. I did notice that a lot of the settings were different to those on the Cura profile, so I updated them to match. The first prints I did were the outer shelves for this geode city. Now let me make it clear, the inside white section of this I had printed for a previous review, but I'd never got around to printing the top and bottom case. On this printer they turned out quite well and they fit nicely over the original part. My main complaint were these puck marks where the layers started and stopped. This is a really cool print when combined with some RGB LEDs and I recommend that you give it a go. I generally like to do a tall print in vase mode and that helps me illustrate the build volume more effectively. To achieve that I printed this vase. It shows nice even extrusion and it feels quite strong too so the layers have bonded together well. There's no evidence as we look from bottom to top of instability or the model separating from the bed and introducing any wobble. I then thought it was time to do some longer prints, so I printed the lower section of my ant formicarium. This print achieved its purpose in being watertight, but I had trouble with the bed retaining adhesion the whole way across, and as you can see, some corners have lifted up and warped badly. It's also worth noting that the company logo that is embossed into the bed is left behind as an imprint in the bottom of all of your prints. After developing that formicarium design down into the smaller final version, I attempted to print the maze-like center section. Unfortunately, I had to give up because I just could not get this print to stick after multiple attempts. It's safe to say I found the adhesion of this bed quite inconsistent for any print that wasn't straightforward. Worst of all, on one of the failures, the printed part peeled up and started a ball on the end of the nozzle. When I discovered this and pulled it off, I noticed something dangling down and it was the Thermista. Now when I've made thermal runaway videos in the past, people say that the Thermista and the heater cartridge will never become separated. This is one common way that's happened to me on two or three printers now that you should definitely watch out for. I thought this was an ideal time to test thermal runaway protection, which this printer is advertised as having, and it was there, but it took far too long to kick in. So long in fact that the PLA on the end of the nozzle had already started smoking and dripping off and when I put the thermistor back into its bore afterwards, the temperature immediately spiked to around 300 degrees. Now let's talk a little bit more about that thermistor placement. Unlike a lot of other printers, this is using a fairly old design and there's no bolt or screw to hold the thermistor in place. This is simply not a safe design, so I contacted the company and expressed my concerns to which they told me that they'd already developed a new hot end and they even sent me this video to show their engineers working on the CAD model. It's nice to know this printer is being improved, but I wonder if the people who've bought one of the first batch even know this is a problem and whether they're going to get the new fix for free. Next up, I decided to try a range of small parts printed in PETG and although they stuck to the bed fine, they suffered from excessive stringing. There's a fair chance that when I put the thermistor back in, as there's no bolt to hold it in an exact location, it's slightly further out and it's under reading temperature and therefore this filament is oozing and that explains the stringing. After everything was cleaned up, the prints look pretty reasonable, but not quite as good as the PLA prints I'd done so far. Next up, I thought I'd try some ABS and I noted that even though I set the bed to go to 100 degrees, the printer had put its own limit in place of only 85. Now I was really excited about this ABS print because I decided to try and print some poly panels as seen on the YouTube channel Make Anything. Unsurprisingly, I had first layer troubles. And although things were improved when I added a G29 to the start G code so it would probe before every print, I just couldn't get a consistent first layer. The finished prints are pretty average to be honest. There's lots of little bumps and oozes and that actually prevents the parts from slotting together like they're meant to. I quickly switched back to a PLA version of the same print and it printed much better with a very nice first layer but the parts still struggle fitting together accurately. The next material I tried was TPU, also known as flexibles, and I upped the extruder temp in the slicer but left the heater bed turned off and I was gobsmacked to see that the print came loose part way through. Normally TPU will stick to anything. The good news is that I re-sliced with a heated bed of 50 degrees, everything stuck well and it even printed this flexible at 100 millimeters per second with pretty consistent extrusion. In my opinion, that's a pretty impressive print. So the last test prints I did were to test the power out resume and the filament run out recovery. Power loss resumed worked well, apart from the printer not actually turning on straight afterwards and needing a second power cycle. After this, it heated up, resumed from the same point 
You can see a line where the print restarted, but I guess that's better than losing your whole print. Filament runout detection worked pretty well. It's not seamless once again, but it is better than the power loss recovery transition and the menus presented on the LCD were straightforward and easy to follow. Many hours of printing, so on to my summary, and we'll start with the pros. Firstly, this machine has been fairly reliable. Yes, there was issues with the way it came to me in the mail. This printer had been through an awfully horrible time between China and Australia, but after that, it's been pretty consistent and I haven't really had to tweak much. Same goes for the rigidity. Obviously, it was loose when I unboxed it, but after tightening everything up, it seems like a fairly solid printer. Those linear rails are rock solid for most of the printer, but the Y-axis is a little bit wobbly because the contact points are very narrow. That enables it to have a really long Y-axis, but it takes away some of the stability that linear rails would otherwise provide. Although the printed instructions were pretty average, the documentation on the SD card was definitely welcome and quite thorough, especially for a new user. The print quality on this printer has been quite reasonable, not the best that I've reviewed, but definitely a pass at least. It seems to struggle with PETG and ABS, but for the majority of my PLA prints, it yielded results that most people would be quite happy with. The customer service has been quite good for me. Now I know that this is going to be on YouTube and therefore a company might treat me a little bit nicer than the average person, but some things that were said implied to me that they have a pretty good relationship with their other customers too, and they're quite happy to listen to feedback. It was nice that the power out recovery and the filament run out both worked because I've tested some printers recently where that just wasn't the case. Finally, the build volume is definitely bigger than something like an Ender 3 with that really long Y axis. Downsides, and the obvious one is the unboxing and assembly. Based on my experience, the packaging just wasn't up to the job and this printer arrived in quite a poor state. Secondly, the bed, that's the one thing that gave me the most trouble. First layer adhesion was inconsistent on any print that wasn't straightforward and it already seems to be showing some signs of wear. I've given feedback that I think the filament path is not optimal because the filament has to come directly down and then turn a sharp corner into the filament runout sensor. And when you look from above, you can see that's not even aligned properly with the extruder. This printer has some nice features, but overall I'd say it's not that refined. It's got an LCD screen instead of the touch screen that you see on a lot of other printers. And while it's quiet at idle, once it's printing, the separate motor drivers and the fans make it quite noisy. Next is safety. And technically it does have thermal runaway protection, but the way the parameters were set, it's just not going to be effective. When you group that with the fact that the thermistor could easily fall out because it's not properly secured, then you have a potential recipe for disaster. If you already own this printer, please get some captain tape or a silicon sock, anything you can to hold the thermistor in place so it can't fall out so easily. Finally, we get to the vital problem, and that's that this printer seems to be constantly in development. If you buy it today, is your version gonna be out of date tomorrow when the newest ones are shipping from the shops with the latest improvements? This is a question I thought was important, so I asked Auto directly. It would take too long for me to read all of this out, but the response from the company is reproduced here in full. Please take the time to pause the video and read it carefully, especially the comparison of their printer to a Ford Mondeo. It's up to each individual whether they think that response is satisfactory, and I urge you to take this chance to give feedback to this company in the comments below. Time for my final summary. And who do I think this printer is for? It's kind of in a middle ground for price and features and size and things like that. So some people are gonna ignore it because they want something much cheaper and other people are gonna jump for a more polished printer and spend more money. Personally, I think it worked quite well if you stick to PLA, it should be pretty reliable and consistent. And with that in mind, and with the rectangular long Y axis, I'm gonna donate this one to a friend who is an architect so he can make architectural models. To show its potential for that, I printed out this PLA White House. The only complaint you could have about this model is a little bit of stringing, but two minutes with a hairdryer and that will be completely gone. After I fix up the thermistor and maybe put on a better stickered sheet for the build surface, I think this printer is gonna be a pretty reliable performer for that friend and I have no trouble giving it to them. What do you think about this printer? I would love to read your opinion in the comments section below. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing.
G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.